Hello, I'm V.B. Price. I'm the editor of NewMexicoMercury.com. I'm here today in the Mercury Library uh, with Democratic candidate for Lieutenant Governor Deb Holland. Her entry into statewide politics is uh, really signals an historic moment in our state. She is the first Native American to ever run for state right office, and obviously then the first Native American to ever run for lieutenant governor. It's really an honor to have her here with us today. She is uh, a, a, an enrolled member of uh, Laguna Pueblo. She is a tribal administrator at San Felipe Pueblo. Uh, she graduated from uh, UNM with a degree in professional writing and then went on to graduate from the UNM Law School. Uh, longtime political activist in New Mexico who's been uh, working uh, uh, for voter rights and children's issues and the environment, and obviously a Democrat. Uh, she is well known to political insiders in our state, but it is not a household name yet, but I'm sure that's going to change soon. We'd like to talk to her today about children's issues, about the environment, about education, uh, and the role she will play in the administration of uh, Governor Gary King. It's an honor to have you with us on Inside New Mexico today. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you for inviting me. So why do you think uh, in uh, the long history of our states uh, since statehood, why hasn't a uh, Native American run for statewide office before? Well, for starters, uh, you might know that Native Americans weren't allowed to have weren't allowed to vote in state elections until 1948. God, that's right. This right, and Miguel Trujillo, mm. who sued the state of New Mexico, won that right for uh, Native Americans who lived in their Indian communities. So he, w of course, was a World War II veteran. He was a Marine, fought in the in the war, and when he came back, he wasn't allowed to vote. So I, uh, I think that might have something to do with it. I think that it. might have something to do with it. <laughs> We're a little behind the eight ball. Yeah. Um, but I think that a lot of us, there have been a lot of folks um, in New Mexico, a lot of Native Americans who care a great deal about who our elected officials are. I, there's a woman up in Taos who is a good friend of mine. She's been registering voters and getting out the vote for close to three decades up in her Pueblo of Taos. So our state is not without people who are championing our ability to be involved in the political process. Um, and so that's part of the reason. I think, too, that, uh, you know, Indian communities, Pueblos, uh, reservations, nations, are their own governments. So right, right, right. Uh, that requires leadership. And so a lot of folks um, do go into tribal leadership and dedicate their time and, and some their lives to making sure that their respective communities run well and maintain relationships where they need to. So that may be another reason. However, I'm hoping that um, that will change because I think we need people on the front lines, so to speak, uh, in putting our perspective into state government so that, you know, we sort of have a voice there. We haven't sure. had that um, on this level. So I'm looking forward to having that opportunity. I can imagine, too, that, uh, that being part of tribal government is an overwhelming responsibility and takes an enormous amount of time. Why did, why did you decide to get into this race this year, this time? I'm disheartened. I'm disheartened with our leadership over the past three and a half years. And, you know, I've been, I've been working to get out the vote for Democrats for probably the last 10 years in our state. And I've worked on a lot of campaigns. I've helped a lot of Democrats get elected. And um, it's, it is my passion to uh, make sure that everybody exercises their right to vote. And certainly in Native American communities, because that's not something that we're um, historically used to doing, uh, we just need, we need people out there encouraging our folks to, to have a part in who our elected officials are. So um, that is... Uh, I felt like this year, 
because I am feeling disheartened with the current leadership, that rather than just to get the vote out like I usually do, that maybe I could inspire other folks to get out and vote by running for office. So um, I have a passion for my community of New Mexico yes. because I have traveled the state lots of times and I've talked to a lot of voters, not just native voters. And I felt like it was something that would help our ticket to succeed. So I'm disheartened too. Uh, I've made no bones about it for, uh, for quite a time. And uh, I'm really, really delighted to see you uh, running for this office. Um, we noticed that, uh, that, the, that the current lieutenant governor sort of, uh, I guess you could say, vanished on a listening tour. I suppose that's what, that's what he's been sort of assigned to do. Um, we also now see that there's that this vast amount of Republican money has been um, uh, put into focus uh, attacking you and attacking uh, Gary King uh, very, very early before uh, the sort of traditional date of uh, politics in New Mexico starting after Labor Day. So I'm wondering, uh, uh, it seems to a lot of Democrats uh, that we're getting clobbered early. Uh, do you think that has any impact on, will have any impact on the, uh, on the eventual outcome? You know, <laughs> I'm sorry. Clobbered early. No, and it's true. You know, it's for one thing, it's really easy for some people to spend other people's money. So we know that all of the TV commercials, the attack ads, so to speak, um, have been paid for by outside sources outside of New Mexico. So, uh, you know, I, I, I have an issue, of course, with um, with folks outside of our state working to buy our elections okay. here. Okay. Uh, I think a lot of people feel the same way I do. I don't think that, um, you know, ten, a barrage of 10 negative ads, one after the other, is going to have the effect that um, perhaps the governor thinks it will. Uh, Gary King has a statewide support. His father was a, a beloved governor of New Mexico. And I think that he cares a great deal about the people here, and I believe that the people know that he cares. They certainly remember his dad, and they know that his dad and his mom care a great deal about children, about jobs, about all the things that matter to us about the environment. So um, in the long run, I don't think it's going to have that bad of an effect. However, each of us has to do what we think is right. And certainly, if that's what they want to spend their money on, they will. Uh, we have, and we will have, a tremendous grassroots campaign. We have a lot of folks, New Mexicans, citizens of New Mexico, who are as disheartened as I am, who are willing and able to get out and get the votes out. There are more Democrats in the state than there are Republicans. As long as we turn our people out, we'll win. I was told recently that uh, despite all these attack ads, we're still only six points behind, which I think is pretty darn good, uh, considering. So, uh, Let's let's get into your analysis of, of what's happened over these last three and a half years. Why do you think uh, New Mexico is last in child well-being in the nation? And what do you think can be done about it in a, in one or two administrations? Well, there's probably a multitude of reasons. <laughs> I'm sure. Um, you know, beginning with Governor Martinez, I she's the person in charge. And so it's her leadership that people follow. Uh, first of all, I think that ch the child hunger problem in New Mexico has a lot to do with that. Yeah. We know that one in three kids go to bed hungry. That was a study that was done by the Annie e. Casey Foundation. When children go to bed hungry and they wake up hungry and they don't have enough to eat, they're not going to do well in school. Absolutely. That's a proven fact. Um, and of course, now that summer's here, um, it is, it's a little bit more of a worry because kids aren't going to school and they're not getting their breakfast or lunch at school. Right. So, uh, so I think the child hunger factor has something to do with it. 
And, um, you know, the current issues that have happened with CYFD, yes. that poor child yes. um, who was killed. Right. Stories like that are, you know, they lead to that statistic. And I just do not see that department fessing up to their responsibility yeah. for, the, for our kids here in New Mexico. And that would definitely change under a Gary King administration. I, um, you know, you have to look at so many things when it comes to kids because school and, you know, well-being and hunger and all those things are tied together. I, um, I feel very certain that at the very least you could tackle the small things, right, mm -hmm. first. And I think that uh, you mentioned earlier about the children's cabinet. That right. was, that was, uh, you know, children's issues were something that Gary King's mother championed very hard. Oh, yeah. And um, currently, that cabinet, there's nothing happening with it. I haven't seen anything in the news about it. Uh, nobody is doing anything, and that's a perfect venue to deal with some of these easy issues. I think child hunger is an easy issue to work on. You just need to get it, folks involved. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And um, and so, if somebody were to pay attention to kids in our state, we wouldn't be last. <laughs> I mean, I that's, think that's about the best answer I've heard. Uh, yes. And when you when you don't pay attention, when you skirt the issues, you know, I, I'm not trying to say that. Um, you know, Susanna Martinez picked her cabinet secretaries. And I, I'm under the impression that because some of them are not from New Mexico, that perhaps they don't understand our citizens here. We have diversity here. They're, you know, from county to county, from city to city, from village to village, from town to town. There are differences in all of us. And um, you can't just have a one-size-fits-all to the entire state when it comes to children. So... Um, so I think that, you know, when we, we get some folks in there that understand our kids, understand their parents, understand how our state is, that perhaps things might become better. Um, I think the child well-being issue is also tied to education. Yes. And we know that uh, this one-size-fits-all testing scheme is... Um, is essentially demoralizing not only the students but the teachers. I spoke to a student a couple months ago who was a senior at his at a high school. He lives in Edgewood and he wasn't going to graduate because of one section of one test oh. that he's been trying to take for the last since he was in 10th grade. Oh, and um, he makes good grades otherwise. It's just that he can't pass this one section of one test. He's very disheartened. Yes. <laughs> and um, I don't think that's a way to educate our kids. So, you, you know, when you lump in graduation rates and, you know, reading rates and so on and so forth about our kids in New Mexico, yes, we're not doing very well when it comes to kids. And, and I really feel that when we get some people in state government who understand that and who will pay attention that we'll be doing a lot better. It's called compassion and it's called intensity. It's called interest and it's called heart. It's called all those things I know. I'd like you to talk a little bit more and tell us a little bit more about the children's cabinet idea because I don't think a lot of New Mexicans remember Diane Dennis started that uh, 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 during the uh, Richardson administration. And maybe you could then sort of, let's talk a little bit more about education, too, because I know you've got some good ideas and you've been thinking about this a lot over the years. I mean, it is a, you know, I think everybody makes this stuff, uh, it is complicated and it's terribly hard to do. But if you want to do it, if you want to do it, you start doing it. And if you don't want to do it, as I, as I think our current leadership feels, they don't particularly want to do it and nothing happens at all. But so... Could you uh, talk a little bit more about, uh, about the children's cabinet idea? So the children's cabinet, um, the lieutenant governor is, is mandated uh, to be on that cabinet. He's, he's the lieutenant governor, whoever it is, is mandated by the Constitution for certain duties and uh, certain boards, committees, and that's one of them. 
I think that uh, under a King administration, I would ask to be the chair of that cabinet so that uh, I could help to set an agenda. You, you know, you can get a, a mix of uh, educators and, um, you know, people who care about a great deal about children to be on that cabinet. Uh, you could set a, a robust and, and aggressive agenda to tackle things like child hunger. And quite frankly, I just don't see it as, I don't see it as that large of a problem. We have so many qualified, smart, dedicated people with heart here in New Mexico. Uh, we could put our heads together and find solutions to just about any problem. So uh, I'm looking forward to that day when I when I have uh, you know when I can put my ideas forth about how to work on those things, and um, it, I think it would be quite successful. With respect to the, the education, my education, where I come from on that, I'm a, I've been a single mom for pretty much all my daughter's life. She's 20 now. She'll be a, a junior at UNM. She's on the lottery scholarship. She, uh, I, I approach education from a perspective of a mother. Uh, she went to preschool when she was two. She And the reason she was able to go to preschool was because I volunteered there. So I worked at the preschool, I cleaned, and I watched out for the kids, and I changed a few diapers, and I sterilized toys, and all of those things so that my we could afford for my daughter to go to preschool. I know that every parent can't do that. I know that early childhood education has played a huge role in my daughter getting through high school, uh, immediately going into college and be, and qualifying for the lottery scholarship because you have to have a certain GPA. And so I believe that, I mean, imagine if every child had that opportunity to go to preschool. Absolutely. To so, have that early, you know, early socialization, early learning, you know, their motor skills are worked on at that age. And they, you know, they learn to be team players. I mean, you know, it's, it's endless. The benefits are endless. And so I know what it did for my daughter, and I want, would not want nothing more than for every child in New Mexico to have that opportunity. I think it would help them a great deal. Um, and, of course, the education is tied to our economy. And I know that some parents, unfortunately, are working two and three jobs just yeah. to keep a roof over their kids' heads. Uh, government has a responsibility to its citizens, and I think that is one way where we can help our state to rise to the top, is by spending some money on early childhood education. It will have long-lasting benefits to all of us, and uh, so I support that. So the, uh, the big word, jobs, appear in our, in our economy, uh, how can, you know, I think you're, you know, when you say these are not problems, you know, for rocket scientists or, you know, but I mean, you know, there's food. Give it to people who need it. You know, I'm always, well, I know I'm probably being civil-minded, but, but uh, what, what do we do? What do we need to do right now to generate the kinds, the kinds of opportunities so people do not have to be working 80, 85, 90 hours a week for miserable wages uh, for no money, um, not even being able to get home to look after their children half the time because they're slaving away in some awful, awful job. What do we need to do, uh, and how can we solve this problem? Well, certainly I think a lot of parents would be helped if the minimum wage were higher <laughs> because I don't know about anyone else, but, you know, I was making what the minimum wage is now, I was making that back in the 80s, right? Yeah. At, right soon after I graduated from high school, that's what I was making in the 80s. And I was by myself, I didn't have any kids, I didn't have, you know, I, I was a single person, uh, was able to afford a tiny little apartment, which was probably a lot cheaper than it is today. Yeah. And gas was probably, you know, a dollar a gallon or yeah. something like that. So uh, everything's going up and wages are not going up. And 
I just think that a lot of parents would be helped tremendously by a raise in the minimum wage. Uh, I just, you know, 80, 90 hours a week is too much for anyone to work. Anyone. Yes, absolutely. And so I think that would benefit children if we did that. Um, you know, we're the only state in the Southwest that has not recovered from this horrible recession. And in fact, where all the other states are gaining jobs, we've actually lost jobs. I just read an article recently that Albuquerque is in a double dip recession. Yes. That sounds horrible, doesn't it? Does. It does. <laughs> and, it uh, is horrible. <laughs> and so why is that? We have to look to the leadership. We have to look to the leadership in our state. We have to look to the leadership in our city. And um, there are just decisions that are not being made. I uh, think it's unfortunate that Governor Martinez is, you know, she travels a lot around the country raising money for her campaign. And I don't see her bringing any businesses here. Come look at New Mexico. Come see what we have here. Come you know, open your business here. We, we welcome you. Uh, we have a lot of um, contracts and so forth for the state going out of state. Right. Yeah. So we're spending a lot of money uh, out of state. And, not, you know, not, a lot is, not enough is coming back in our state. And, of course, that leads me to the recent behavioral health issue right. yeah. that, that we've read about in the newspaper recently where the state spent $270 million on an Arizona company while a dozen or so New Mexico businesses basically went out of business. That's not right. So I want to get back to these thornier issues in just a minute, but I wanted, I'm curious as to how, how, has, uh, how has the media in New Mexico uh, responded to your, cam uh, to your candidacy so far? I've had, you know, I've had a few articles, a couple in the journal. Uh, there was one in the Farmington Daily Times, just an opinion piece. Uh, there's been a few in the Santa Fe New Mexican. And um, so, of course, you, you never get enough free media, right? Yeah, no, it's, true. It's, true. it's true. I mean, it's, in an ideal world, you'd have an article on the front page every day, but yeah. uh, that's, that's not happening. Um, you know, it's a governor's race. Yeah, this is. race is a governor's race. It always is. And I'm thrilled to be on the ticket with Gary King. I will, I'll do my best. I'll work extremely hard. Um, I think that because of my activist, activism in the past, I may be able to pull in some votes. I'm, I'm, we're going to put folks out uh, in the Indian majority precincts to make sure that those people get out to vote. So, um, so I, you know, in a word, I'm grateful for the yeah. for the few articles that have come out. But um, yeah, there can always be more. Yeah. Now, those of us who are interested in New Mexico and in and in these questions um, really are. And who are disheartened by the governor are really heartened by your candidacy. Uh, I mean, you've said some things here today that so simply, so cleanly, so without any prevarication. I'll use the nice word uh, that it's 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 wonderful. It's inspiring, and uh, I'm really hoping that. Uh, I mean, I think you'll be great on television. I think all kinds of things. I hope there's a debate with John Sanchez. I can't imagine there will be, but I hope there will be because I think you demolish him. Um, so. Uh, but that being said, my, my obviously, I'm obviously biased, but everybody knows that too. Uh, what do you think? Um, so, so part of your role as lieutenant governor is to is to uh, is to break ties in the Senate, is is uh, to uh, well, actually, you're the president of the Senate, right? Um, to um, to s sit on numerous boards, and to what to channel. Uh, to channel the administration's uh, uh, viewpoints and policies into those boards. Actually, what I really like to know what kinds of what kinds of roles will you be playing? Well, um, of course, I think one of the one of the main jobs is to preside over the Senate. Yeah. So uh, I'm eager to 
have maybe uh, an impact on that. Uh, working for the Pueblo of San Felipe and, you know, being active in Native American issues for a long time. It seems like every legislative session when we're up there lobbying for things that we're working really on killing bad bills as opposed to supporting good ones. Yes. And it's not just because I'm, you know, I know about and am active on Indian issues. I think, you know, Indian issues, anything that's good for Native Americans, I think is good for the state. We don't want anything different than any other New Mexican wants. Clean water, clean air, opportunities for growth, um, you know, yeah. things like that. So, um, so that's unfortunate. I would really love to see more good bills being put, put up in our legislature. Things, you know, I'm under the impression that if it's not good for New Mexicans, I'm not going to support it, right? So, uh, so that that would be nice to perhaps, you know, have opportunities to, to speak with legislators, you know, in that respect, just to, you know, let them know, yeah, this is what the people... This is good for the people. This is not good. Um, so, so that might be an opportunity. Um, and, and I mean, I guess I just, in that vein, anything that is good for our state, I'll support. Anything that's not, I won't. It's that simple. So let's talk a little bit about the environment. Okay. Uh, we have a, uh, uh, a governor who I think... Uh, is let is at the very least let things go. Uh, we have terrible problems at, at uh, the Kirtland Air Force Base. We have awful problems at WIP. We have uh, probably uh, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of uranium mines right next to your pueblo and uh, and on the Navajo Nation. And uh, we have all kinds of health problems related to mining and, and environmental issues. Um, it sounds like you're going to be an activist, Lieutenant Governor. Uh, could you tell me what what your views are uh, on environmental matters in the state as it stands and where we can go? Well, certainly the way to go isn't to lax on environmental protections. Yes. That's uh, That really scares me a great deal, to think that uh, mining companies don't have to worry about the waste that they produce because we know that those types of things seep into the groundwater and people drink that water and it's not good for anybody. So there's that environmental, I, I'm all for environmental protection. I, I'm, I don't think that, you know, it's kind of sad when you think about some of these corporations and I understand that corporations have to make money but they don't have to make an obscene amount of money at the expense of the environment. Mm. I think that if they're making the mess that they should clean it up at the very least. That's not too much to ask. Um, second, you know, recently uh, there's been in, in, you know, in the news about uh, this uranium mine that was going in close to Mount Taylor. Yes. And I had an opportunity to speak with several of Acoma governors about that issue, and also to my governor at Laguna. And you know, I'm not, I'm not for desecrating sacred sites either, yeah. to um, for mining, for money, for that kind of thing. Yeah. I think there's a place to mine in New Mexico, sure. and I think there's places not to mine in New Mexico. I think we can have a balance between uh, creating jobs and protecting our environment. I don't think we have to sacrifice one to have the other. Mm -hmm. So I'm anxious to take a look at all of those things to, to make sure that we put our people and our land and our water first. Because if we don't have clean water, I think that will have an impact on a lot of folks who like to grow things to eat. <laughs> and right. <laughs> right, we have a lot of small farmers in our state. We do. And we need to protect those people. I mean, we can't live without food. And 
you know, when you think about how things are all interrelated, you know, the small farmers, they sell at a lot of farmers markets, people buy those things, uh, it gives them, you know, opportunities for growth in their small farms, and we get to eat healthy food in return. So I just think that, I just don't think we need to sacrifice the environment for money. So uh, are you going to go on a listening tour like uh, like Lieutenant Governor Sanchez has? And if you are, who are you going to listen to? <laughs> well, I, part of the Lieutenant Governor's job is to be the ombudsman of the state. So I know that if constituents have issues uh, and the Lieutenant Governor can help the constituents to resolve their issues by connecting them up with the relevant departments or department secretaries or, or department employees uh, to resolve those issues, that's, that's definitely something that I'm happy to do. Um, the listening to her part, I guess it depends on uh, once um, Gary King and I get into office and I am very clear about the things that I would love to work on, then we'll decide who I should listen to, <laughs> right? Uh, but at the outset, of course, uh, I plan on listening a great deal to teachers. I plan on listening to the public education commissioners because they haven't been listened to over the last three and a half years. I plan on listening to uh, workers. I plan on listening to Native American tribal leaders because they haven't been listened to uh, a great deal at the time either. So, um, and, and of course, any voters in New Mexico who feel that they haven't been listened to, I'm happy to listen. Uh, however, I think we will have our plates full with working on a lot of the issues that we've just discussed today to make sure that uh, we do the right things, the good things, the um, common sense things for New Mexicans to get us back on track. So I know you've already been, uh, been, been listening a lot to teachers and to school kids about what's happening with what seems to many of us, myself included, a, a debacle, a terrible debacle really, that's sort of poisoning uh, the joy of learning and, and just really criminal things. What do you hear teachers telling you? And, and uh, what do you hear their students telling you about these, these evaluations and these testings and this, this sort of uh, 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 sausage approach to, uh, uh, to teaching and, um, and learning uh, to take tests as opposed to learning how to, how to live and, and have a good life? So, I mean, I think teachers who are frustrated and feel demoralized because of the, you know, their evaluation scheme that relies very heavily on the standardized testing, which does not take into consideration the, the diversity of our student population here in New Mexico, uh, when they leave the state, when they quit their jobs at any New Mexico school district and leave the state, to work somewhere else because they'll get a 25% raise. Plus they'll have opportunities to actually teach students instead of spending time uh, prepping them for a test. That speaks the loudest to us. Oh, it does. So it's unfortunate and I've known several educators who have been friends of mine for a long time who are leaving. They're leaving. It's very sad. So. Um, yeah, thing uh, you know, back when I was going to school, every you know in kindergarten, every teacher had a piano in her room. I don't know if you remember that. No. If it was the same for you, every teacher had a piano in their room, and there was always time out of every day where you sang. Yeah. And um, you know, teachers like I still remember my kindergarten teacher. I still remember my third grade teacher. They had impacts on my life. Yeah. And, and I don't want our kids leaving school and all they remember about school are taking tests. Gosh. Oh, it's so, it's so I, think it's, I think it's just counterintuitive. I think it's counterproductive. And um, 
that is definitely something that needs to change. Now, I know I've spoken to a lot of public education commissioners, and they have told me that when they have meetings and the secretary-designate shows up to the meetings, she does not stay to listen to their ideas. So it's unfortunate that Governor Martinez sent Lieutenant Governor Sanchez on a listening <laughs> tour, but I kind of feel like she should have sent her cabinet members on a listening tour also mm. because I don't think they're listening to a lot of people out there and certainly not listening about education. So I, I will listen. I really will. Uh, I think that um, we all have to work together to to make this work out. And And I wholeheartedly feel that we have wonderful and bright students in our state and they just need to be you know you need to coax that that love of learning out of them and they'll show it to you this has been inspiring for me thank you so much for being with us i know you're you're a very busy person and you're up to your years in a campaign and jobs and other things it's but you've really said things very clearly and in ways that i think i've longed to hear uh this the problems in our state are common sense problems in many, many ways. And you've really hit the nail on the head, and I'm very glad to meet you, and I hope we get to deal with, with other issues in the future on air and, and, uh, and, and talk some more in the future. Thank you. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here. Thanks for the invitation.